Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. All right, so all right, so today's episode is entitled You're So Vain. You probably think this podcast is about you. <laughs> you <laughs> wait, wait, you, you you mean this podcast isn't about me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that get that good old uh hit, which was I think I was in the top 100 songs of all time or something. I don't oh, know. Maybe it was. I don't Classic know. Classic rock. Everybody makes a list just so they can be on it. And what does that tell you? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, you know, best podcast of all time, number one, the Indigo Podcast. Yes, uh, indeed. Yeah, out of podcast with partners in no, <laughs> Ohio yeah. and Utah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about narcissism. We're going to talk about this idea of narcissism, what it is. Uh, and then we're going to take this into a different realm and talk about narcissistic leaders and what they do to organizations. Finally, we're going to talk about how to spot, how to avoid, and how to deal with some of these narcissistic leaders that you might find around you. Yeah, you know, this topic, I'm sure, you know, anybody that follows a bunch of politics and Twitter stuff is, you know, they're all abuzz with ideas. And we're mm -hmm. not really going to go there today. But I want to couch this within a larger framework of humanity. Um, largely, when people grow up, everybody views everybody generally as fully responsible for themselves, mm -hmm. right? Which I, which I think is a good idea, mm -hmm. right? But nobody looks at somebody um, with, say, Down syndrome in the same perspective as they would that somebody, and this is a charged word, neurotypical, right? And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if there is a neurotypicality. But that being said, we have situations with mental health and brain issues in the workplace all the time. Um, depression, anxiety, ADD, right? Mm -hmm. And there's not, people don't generally talk about those no. uh, items a whole lot. And you know, it's this idea of we're we're all equal, we're all the same ish, and and we're all going to charge against this capitalistic society and meritocracy and and I mean those are some okay lenses, right? I'm not I'm not going to denigrate those lenses as decent ways to view the world, but there are some challenges that we face with just how people's brains are wired in the workplace, right? We do. We do. And narcissism is one of those. And, you know, th this is something that so this is not my area specifically of psychology. I'm an industrial and organizational psychologist. So we tend to shy away from and not study abnormal types of things. However, uh, you know, narcissism as a no kidding personality disorder, uh, as we'll talk about, is something that is um, diagnosable and uh, has some relevance to the workplace and perhaps is something that we should look at more within the field of biopsychology because it happens and it has implications for how organizations work, how people interact, how leaders lead. So why don't we start by diving in and trying to define this a little bit and talking about narcissism and exactly what it is. So, you know, this has its roots, at least the, the word narcissist or narcissism, this has roots in Greek mythology. And uh, so there's this, there's this, <laughs> yeah, there's this dude. Right. Like, I guess he was a hunter. Uh, his name was Narcissus. And, um, you know, he apparently was a very beautiful young man. Uh, and people fell in love with him. And, uh, but he just, he was pretty contemptuous of all of them. He didn't really pay attention to them. Uh, and then he was out hunting in the woods. And uh, then uh, someone found him and said, uh, you know, and, and fell for him basically, right? Because he is so beautiful. Um, but long story short, he, uh, you know, pushed everyone away from him. And then Nemesis, who is apparently the goddess of retribution and revenge, learned about all these nasty things that Narcissus had done to people and decided to punish young Narcissus. Uh, and she took him to a, a pool of water 
And guess what? Narcissist looked down, and what did he behold in the reflection? <laughs> Himself! <laughs> <laughs> this is like the worst telling of the story. <laughs> we are not classics professors, so don't don't look to us to woo people into the um, great classical conversation. But what, Whatever. I thought my storytelling was fine. <laughs> um, and so uh, when, when young Narcissist looked into the pool and saw his reflection... Because he had this high regard, let's say, for himself, he uh, fell in love with himself and basically, um, you know, just sat there and then uh, bad things happened. Anyway, so it's this idea that, um, you know, narcissists are very, very much into themselves. They are very, and it goes way beyond, you know, just kind of uh, normal vanity, I suppose. Uh, it's, it's this deep, deep love of self, but it really goes beyond that. And to the extent that, uh, the, um, diagnostic and statistical manu manual of dis mental disorders, uh, the, uh, version five, which is commonly referred to as the DSM five. Um, this is something that's published by the American Psychiatric Association. This actually provides criteria for what's called narcissistic personality disorder, uh, and so maybe we should walk through a little bit of that because I think this does a good job of, of distilling some of the elements of what it actually is as a personality disorder. Right. So anybody that's familiar with the history of the DSM um, knows that it it's had its challenges, but it's an important book because it's documenting our current conversation in the world of psychology about how to think about some of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the, you know, they define, this is a great place to go for definitions. Um, and that's why we're going there. Um, cause normally, normally we kind of leave this to the clinical folk, but yeah. sometimes, sometimes something is so impactful. So if you're going to study leadership and organizations and stuff, there are pieces that come out of the clinical world that are just so huge that, that kind of grab you by the throat and make you pay attention to them. And narcissism is one of those. And so, mm -hmm. First, let's define um, what is a personality disorder, Ben. So, uh, I mean, a personality disorder is has to do with uh, impairments in a, in personality. So, you know, both how you see yourself and how kind of your default operating style, and how you interact with other people. And it involves the presence of some pathological personality traits. So, you know, in IO psychology, we typically focus on those personality traits that are most uh, relatable to the workplace. Things like the big five, right? The, the big five, the conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness to experience and extroversion, right? Those types of things. Um, but, you know, this is more about pathological personality traits and personality in and of itself in both this definitional context of a personality disorder and um, within just general uh, conversations about personality, you know, things like conscientiousness. This has to do with these relatively enduring uh, patterns of behavior. Um, kind of your default operating style. These are not completely immune to situational um, impacts. So, for example, you know, you may be in a context that really uh, pushes you to behave in a different way and outside of your normal personality, and, and that does happen. And your personality may change a little bit over time, but in general, they're relatively stable after you reach kind of latter adolescence, maybe your early 20s. And so, you know, when we talk about personality disorders, these are more these pathological um, personality traits, these, these personality traits that, that are, are generally not helpful, we'll say, in the course of, of life and interacting with uh, other people. Yeah. So when I, when I look at this stuff, and I think it was DSM-3 or 4, I forget. You know, I'm most familiar with 4 because that's, that's when I did the study. That was a version that was out um, when I studied all this stuff. Um, but, you know, the deal is just one thing's not going to get get you on this list. We all know somebody that spends a lot of time in front of the mirror or something, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're like, man, what a narcissist. And OK, sure, maybe you can use that phrase. But, you know, and I think it was in the four years you had to meet like five of nine criteria or something. So you mm. actually have to have most of this stuff to be what we would call patholo pathologically narcissistic, right? That's, that's right. And so the first part has to do with impairments and self-functioning. Uh, so it has to do with either an issue with your identity. So, you know, you are 
um, you know, really vacillating between these extremes of exaggerated self appraisal. So thinking of yourself as, as really, um, quite all that. And also, uh, what we call self-direction, which is where, you know, all of your goal setting is based upon approval from others. You're only, you know, you're always seeking to an extreme extent that approval from other people. And, you know, people are in this, in this context or with this disorder also, you know, are very oftentimes unaware of even their own emotions. So in terms of impairments of self-functioning, it's either these identity issues or it's these uh, self-direction issues in terms of how you choose what to do with yourself. And it's all based upon approval from other people. Now, in addition to having these impairments in self-functioning, it also, you also have to have in order for you to be diagnosed, I suppose, clinically as having uh, narcissistic personality disorder, uh, you would also have to have some of these impairments in interpersonal functioning. So it's not just about yourself, but it's also about how you interact with other people. All right. So, you know, when it comes to themselves, they don't really have a solid sense of self. They are mm -hmm. relying on other people to define them and give them self-esteem. And that's based on their individual identity and, and what they do. Everything they do in life, haters around that. Right. Um, but now the interpersonal piece, one of the big pieces is these guys lack empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Ben, like in IO psych and that kind of stuff, like, why is empathy important? Well, I think empathy is important just in general because it helps us to imagine how other people are feeling. It helps us to imagine what they're going through. It helps us to relate with other people and being in tune with their reactions, even being able to potentially uh, anticipate someone's reaction. So if you're making a decision, for example, thinking about how people might react, that empathetic type of, um, uh, of sense can help you to, to better navigate what that is. Um, and you know, when you don't have any empathy, uh, then you oftentimes will not really know, right. What other people are, are feeling. Um, and you know, if you have narcissistic personality disorder, you're really only, um, taking in information if it's relevant to, you know, how people perceive you <laughs> because you are the center of that universe, right? The narcissist, uh, you know, changing a light bulb, um, just holds on to that bulb and lets the world revolve around them. So that's uh, that's one piece of it. But in addition to empathy, then it's also some issues in terms of interpersonal functioning with functioning with regard to intimacy. Yeah. So these guys, what was one of the quotes? And I can't even remember where I read this, but um, one of the flags for a narcissist in a relationship as if they say, you know, I'm awesome at everything but relationships, <laughs> which, which, you know, that's maybe your spidey senses to go uh, up. But um, the, the reason why is because, you know, that empathy issue really impacts how they view how other people's are are in the world in relation to themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So relationships for them largely exist to serve their own self-esteem regulation. So a narcissist is out in the world. Nobody's paying attention to them. They're having a bad day because they can't get a sense of self without that kind of, I, I see it as a sonar ping. You know, they ping and, you know, say <laughs> something to, you know, <laughs> ping <laughs> to, to see if they get anything back. But if they get nothing back, they don't have a sense of self at that point, right? Right, because it's, and, all, it's all based upon reflection from others. Right, and that's that whole thing of narcissists looking in the pool, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when they come to relationships, it's often not about a love or appreciation of the other person. Or it, I mean, I'm going to say it's not if you're a narcissist. Right. It's really about using that person to help them regulate their own internal emotions. It's a, it's a form of borrowed functioning, right? Mm. And, and that's, that's this idea of like, I need you to be around here. And when I'm dipping, cause I'm not feeling good about myself, you're going to plus me up and it, it's becomes a real vampiric type thing. So, but if, so if you're in a relationship an intimate relationship or other, you know, friendship with the narcissist, um, you might spend four hours listening to them go on about their day and all the bad stuff. And you say, man, I'm having a bad day too. You know, kind of my turn to share. Yeah. Narcissist just checks out. Like, who, <laughs> who cares? Thanks for letting me puke on you and propping me up emotionally. 
Now you go back into the corner. I'll get you out when I need you again. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's these kind of issues of um, uh, self-functioning and these issues of interpersonal functioning. And then some pathological personality traits uh, that has to do with, you know, either grandiosity. So this is where you, you know, feel entitled. Narciss narcissistic people uh, feel very entitled to, um, you know, to certain jobs or positions or certain types of approval. Uh, and, you know, it's very self-centered. They have this firm belief that they are better than other people and can be very condescending. Right. So this is a, a key way in which you probably can recognize uh, some elements of narcissism in other people when they when they are consistently condescending towards other people in this truly held, it seems, belief that they're better than other people. And then just uh, attention seeking. So making excessive attempts to be the focus of the attention, being, uh, you know, looking for that approval and that admiration at all all times. Yeah, you know, so I was in the mid for those of you that don't know, I was actually a professional musician for some years out of Nashville. And you would run into a lot of this. And we're going to get into mm. where, you know, there's kind of a continuum of narcissism, right? Um, yeah. A lot of people aren't going to tell their parents, hey, I'm going to go be a professional musician after I just spent all this money on a college degree. <laughs> 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 you know, but, you know, some of these guys do it. You know, you look at Garth Brooks and some of these guys and how they got they start their start. Um, it takes a bit of gumption and belief in self, right? But it tips over into the pathological, right? Um, when you have that feeling of entitlement, well, why aren't I CEO? I'm better mm -hmm. than Bill Gates. Who's this Bill Gates guy? And I'm like, dude, you're like a guy in like rural Mississippi, um, that hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got to do something <laughs> to get a CEO or something. And so, you know, we have these issues, and I, I just want to highlight the fact that. Some people can have some of this stuff and it doesn't, and it's really where it creates an impairment and lack of relationship with others and destroys functioning of people around you. That's right. right? Yeah. Yeah. And so again, these are uh, impairments that are relatively stable and across and consistent across situations. So, hmm. you know, if, if someone is exhibiting some grandiosity or they're, uh, you know, really seeking attention, uh, it could be a one-off. And you, you, you would want, and that, that's one of the tricky things about spotting narcissism is you have to observe someone and really get to know them over a, a period of time and a period of, and a, a range of situations. That's going to really tell you whether or not this person is truly narcissistic or not, um, because just one, you know, data collection point is not going to get you there. Right. So if you're, if you're Stephen Hawking, right. And and you're just working, working, and, you know, you get your first prize, you're feeling pretty good. But, you know, when you get all the way up to that epicurotic theory of the universe, and you're like, you know what? I'm pretty banging as a physicist. You know, <laughs> Stephen wanted to say that. I'm like, you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take, I mean, there's a difference when your, you know, feelings are based in some reality or some solid view of your existential worth as a two-legged homo That's sapien, right. right? That's right. So it's not narcissistic for us to say that the Indigo Podcast is the best podcast that has ever been created, right? Well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, yes. Obviously oh, that you had to bring that up is, is obtuse, Ben, because it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> oh, but the, the, the key word here is impairment, right? The, these people are struggling. And, and to put on your empathy hat right now, because we've, many of us have been victims of a, um, of a personality disorder or a narcissist, which yeah. I think well, I read one it, estimate is like one in a hundred people, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, it, here's a funny thing though. You know, you mentioned that it's important to be empathetic of, of people with these types of impairments. And I agree. I think it's a particularly challenging to be empathetic of someone, uh, you know, with someone who, who's very, problem is that they aren't empathetic back <laughs> right so you know when you're dealing with a narcissist uh you know it's 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 difficult to um you know empathize with them and to be have some sympathy towards their situation because they are oftentimes treating you in a condescending way and see themselves as the center of the universe 
you know. Oh uh, yeah, of- I might. My empathy hat only comes on when we're intellectualizing this stuff. But <laughs> times when I've worked with or for these jack wagons, <laughs> right. oh my god, you're like, yeah. I want to strangle them. <laughs> yeah, That's right. You're just like, what is going on with this dumb skull? Yeah, um, right. And so you know, it's also important to realize that these are issues that these impairments impairments are not just due to some physiological issue. It's not, a, a, you know, an issue of drug abuse or medication a, a, abuse or some sort of um, general medical condition, um, because then that would be something separate. That would not necessarily be narcissistic personality disorder. Right. But it's with the same annoying outcome. So like yeah. from a practical yeah. level, you know, nature, nurture, we don't know how to fully unpack that yet. If you're doing a lot of drugs, well, you're probably not fully responsible for your mental state at any, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at any given moment. However, as the receivers of these kinds of behavior, um, well, we've got some moves to do. So, so yeah. let, let's talk about, so we've got like a clinical definition. We kind of have a working definition of what it means to be a narcissist. Um, let's talk about kind of what they do to organizations and, and how they are as leaders. Yeah. And, you know, it's... Um they're just very tough to deal with in life, right? Because everything is about them. And so now if we kind of, you know, move on to thinking about narcissistic leaders, uh, there's, uh, the, the problem here is that, first of all, they exist. There are na- pre- leaders in organizations who are narcissistic. And maybe it even takes just a tiny bit of narcissism, or maybe it's just a healthy sense of self-confidence to even want to be a leader. And that's kind of another issue. But, you know, a big problem here is that there's a lot that narcissistic leaders have in common with what we know to as what characterizes a transformational leader. Uh, you know, narcissistic leaders in some contexts can be very effective in certain ways. And that's what's tricky here. Um, so there, it, it's a mixed bag, and there's this overlap with this, this area of research on transformational leadership. And um, uh it's tricky to kind of make that distinction, but I think it's really important to do so if we're going to have any luck at trying to spot and avoid these types of people. Right. So I just want to say narcissists are hand grenades. And if you, somebody <laughs> hands you a hand grenade with a pen, you don't observe the quality of its construction for a moment, right? <laughs> You're going to chunk that thing as far as you can and, and d- try to dive behind something for cover, right? But the problem is, is these hand grenades look like delicious pieces of fruit sometimes, right? They and that, that, that delicious yeah. piece of fruit comes out of the literature and what we call transformation, transformational leadership. And Ben, what is a transformational leader? Right. So, you know, this is a, uh, so transformational leadership is a, an area of research that's been going on for a number of decades and is fairly well established. Uh, there's some good research support behind the value of transformational leaders. And what transformational leaders are, are this, these are these people who kind of, as the name implies, they are people who transform their organizations. They are agents of change. They are um, people who bring about the necessary um, shifts that are in, involved and needed for an organization. And they really can be a great force for good within their organizations. Now, of course, they could also be a uh, a force for for ill. um, But generally, you know, at least in organizational psychology, we look at how this transformational leadership and how transformational leaders can be a great force for good. Uh, And the key distinction here is that they are uh, most um, effective in terms of uh, being a positive force when they have motivations that are for the the good of the collective, not when they are self-centered and when they are just trying to look out for themselves. Um, And so it has to do with these different behaviors and these different things that leaders can do to inspire and lead change. Uh, This really comes from some uh, scholarship that was started a number of decades ago by uh, the late Bernard Bass. And he wrote extensively on this and he uh, conducted a lot of the foundational research on it. We'll put a link to one article that he co-authored with a handful of other folks uh, in the show notes, Um, but one of them has some good definitional work, I I think, that could be helpful for our listeners to understand what is transformational leadership. And this is a good thing. You're going to hear this and you're going to be like, all right, it sounds like a pretty good thing. And it it oftentimes really can be, right? Yeah. So this idea of transformational leadership, there are times when organizations need to change. And that's when... 
hey, you kind of are looking for that kind of transformational leader. Um, and in the army, and there, there's some literature on this. I haven't done a deep dive to say how qualified this is, but we have this term called wartime generals and peacetime generals. Mm -hmm. And anecdotally, it, it kind of works. You know, if you've got to push through and break through a new industry, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's way different than somebody who needs to be a tender of the ship that's already built and sailing, right? right? Um, so transformational leaders generally show themselves or emerge um, during times of struggle or change. Mm -hmm. And during times of struggle and change, this is exactly when people start to look for these type of individuals. And because they have, there's a lot of uncertainty in that group of people or cohort or organization, whatever. And this is exactly when a narcissist can exploit these kinds of scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. um, but let's let's first fully define what is a transformational leadership, a transformational leader, and then we'll contrast that with a narcissist. So there, there's right. four straights from this uh, article that Bass wrote. So go ahead, Ben. Right. So generally, we look at these four different characteristics of transformational leadership, and, and they are idealized influence, inspirational motivation, intellectual stimulation, and individualized consideration. And I'll just briefly kind of explain those uh, a little bit without getting too luxury here, because um, goodness knows we don't want that, right? Um, you got you got to pay pay for those. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking of all your students. They're like, ah, yeah, we paid for it, and we, they wouldn't give us a refund or something. <laughs> That's right, no refunds. Um, so, idealized influence. This is this idea that transformational leaders are these people who we admire, we respect them, we trust them. Uh, we identify with them. They have a lot of what we call referent power because they, you know, we like we like these folks. Um, we're like, yeah, I want to be like this person. Uh, they they do things to earn credit with their followers in terms of being selfless by considering their followers' needs over their own. Uh, they share risks with their followers, and uh, you know, they 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 do things. Um, they don't ask their people to do things that they wouldn't do themselves. So that's an idealized influence idea. Mm -hmm. The next piece is inspirational motivation. So they. Uh, behave in ways that, that motivate the people around them by providing some challenge and some meaning to what they're trying to do, uh, you know, which kind of brings people um, together as a team. It also helps people to uh, be excited about what's going on. The next piece is what we call intellectual stimulation. And this is about, you know, tapping into people's natural curiosity that we that most of us have to some extent. Um, allowing people to be innovative, be creative, uh, you know, questioning some assumptions, trying to reframe problems, um, you know, when people make mistakes or they offer some new idea, transformational leaders don't criticize that. They uh, listen with an open mind. Like, these are all really good things, right, in terms of creating new ideas and creative solutions. Um, and then the last piece is what we call individualized consideration. And this is where you know, they get to know each person. This is kind of that idea of leader member exchange to some ex extent, where they, they focus on that, those high quality relationships that they're building with each person by saying, you know, I, I really want to know who this person is. I really want to make sure that, you know, what they're doing in this organization uh, is aligned with where they want to go professionally and so forth to really, uh, you know, be a coach and a mentor to the people who are working for them. So, I mean, these things together, idealized influence, inspirational motivation, intellectual stimulation, and individualized consideration are some of the key behaviors or facets of this idea that we call transformational leadership. And these are all, you know, really positive things. It can be, and the research suggests, um, can be great for the effectiveness of a team. Right. And so this is where, you know, and we deal with this when we go into clients and when we just talk to people as we're traveling or doing speaking engagements and that thing. You know, everybody's reading the Bill Gates way, mm -hmm. the Steve Jobs way, the, you know, all, all these great people. And then we got we got to do these ways. And, th and then maybe they get beyond that. Right. Because the spoiler alert, there's not a single script on this stuff. And some of these yahoos were just accidentally successful. What about right? the Chris Everett way? 
<laughs> highly <laughs> ill-advised. Highly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, the webs we weave. But um <laughs> the um yeah, don't I don't advise a lot of things. I my blood can help you. I will just put it that way. <laughs> so um anyway, where were we going? Where were we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so that I mean it's this idea that narcissistic leaders can have some of these transformational elements, right? Um, and it, it's very important to uh, you know, realize that you, know, you were talking about how there's people will read these different kind of examples of like what one person did that was right, right, and right. so forth. And you know, this is about uh distilling across all of these different um, context, not just looking at one person. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's a, a nice little stay, saying that we like to uh, use in in, uh, in research. You know, that uh, an anecdote does not equal data, right? Uh, someone's a story about one person doesn't uh, necessarily, you know, create something that's generalizable across everybody. You know, we can't just all just copy what Bill Gates did and yeah, because like, you're not Bill Gates, right? Well, right? we're not Bill Gates, and we're not operating in the exact same context as Bill Gates, right? No one right. is. And so and, the and second so, right. step of maturity from there is they may go to this leadership stuff, mm -hmm. and it's actually good. They read some transformational leadership stuff, but guess what? Not everybody in an organization. It's like yes, our organization is made of sixteen hundred transformational leaders. <laughs> um, that doesn't quite work either. And so it's almost, or, you know, we were talking to somebody the other day and they were talking about core competencies and values of their company. And well, we want to do a thousand of these because a thousand of these things are great. Well, you can only focus on so much at a time as a, <laughs> as a leader. Right. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the reason we're talking about transformational leadership within the context of narcissism and narcissistic leadership is that narcissistic leaders can have uh, some of these, or maybe even all of these to some degree, some of these transformational elements. Um, and, and when you know, a transformational leader is needed, yeah. sometimes you pick up that hand grenade of the narcissistic leader instead, because they look similar. They, they, they really can. And you know the, the, what's really interesting about this idea, and so we're going to be drawing, especially in the next section of, of the episode today, we're going to be drawing from a, an article that just came out. It's hot off the press. Um, by Charles O'Reilly and Jennifer Chapman in the California Management Review. And this article is titled Transformational Leader or Narcissist, How Grandiose Narcissists Can Create and Destroy Organizations and Institutions. We'll post a link to that, of course, in the show notes. Um, but what's really interesting and the point that they make, which I think is really compelling and important, is that there is this kind of, uh, you know, this overlap between some of these things that narcissists do that and what we oftentimes look for in terms of transformational leadership but the uh, fundamental uh difference here is what i don't know tell me ben i forgot well it, it's it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's that you know the fundamental difference is that narcissisms have generally do so with only their own interests in mind uh you know they're they're doing these things with for their own purposes it's not about the group it's not about the organization it's fundamentally about themselves and it's about, you know, their own grandiosity, right? This, this idea that they are more important than other people, that other people aren't as are, are beneath them. Uh, and so when you right. have, yeah, right. So Con you contrast that with the transformational leadership. It's all about, you know, inspiring the group, yeah. equipping the group, getting the group to function better. Narcissist, it's like, hey, did you see what I did? I led this organization to right. I, I alone type dialogue, right? That's right. So when you have transformational leadership combined with narcissism, that's when you have narcissistic leadership. Uh, and like you said, you know, I think th there are many organizations when they're selecting leaders uh, can run the risk of thinking that that, that, that uh, candidate for a top job um, might be, you know, this transformational leader, but in, when in fact it might be at the hand grenade, as you put it, of the narcissistic leader. I mean, take a look at Christopher Columbus. Now, we don't have, at least I don't know, there's probably a historian that might know, like any assessment of his mental wherewithal. Mm. But this is a person, I mean, it took some gumption to sail and say the world's round rather than flat or something, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Like, it takes a certain amount of beliefs, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if he had 
some narcissistic traits. Um, politicians, most politicians probably have a degree of narcissism because mm -hmm. what, who in their right mind goes and puts themselves out there in those kinds of ways, <laughs> right? Um, it helps people go into challenging areas and take risk. And if nobody risked anything, you know, we'd still be back in the Stone Age. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I, so I think the point here is, you know, that some narcissism is a good thing, perhaps. Uh, but that's, that's a far cry from what we talked about earlier in terms of actual, no kidding, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, so, you know, a little bit of narcissism, probably okay. Right. In terms of, um, helping people at least feel confident about themselves and taking a little bit of risk. Right. So is narcissistic leadership a problem? Absolutely. Um, now if I look at say the accounting personalities and that I had in grad school, a lot of those guys just wanted, I need to get into a big stable company and count the beans. And mm. that that's great. That's no problem, but that doesn't, that doesn't put us on the moon. Right. Um, let's talk about some of these examples of CEOs, right? right. Um, so some people have said Steve jobs was a total narcissist. Mm hmm. But that's there's right. also been books that said like, oh, wow, what it's so great. Look, he did all this work with um, DreamWorks. Then he came back and saved Apple, you know. Yeah. So I think this article by O'Reilly and Chapman from the California Management Review does a good job of kind of talking about some of these aspects. And, you know, what they and I'll quote this little uh, this one passage from that talking about Steve Jobs. You know what, what they write is, quote, Steve Jobs is oftentimes or is often cited as a prototypical transformational leader. But his biographer, Walter Isaacson, described how Jobs humiliated others, was impulsive, took credit for others' work, lied, and believed that the rules did not apply to him, even routinely parking in handicapped parking spots. <laughs> and, and I continue, oh, man. And I continue, <laughs> I, I continue quoting. He says, oh, no. says jo Jobs' girlfriend, after reading about the narcissistic personality disorder, decided that the criteria applied perfectly to him. And so... <laughs> You know, I, end quote. But uh, so, you know, I, I suppose we could see that there are some elements of how Steve Jobs operated that fit into this narcissistic um, uh, personality type of, of, of paradigm. So, you know, was he transformational? Did he do some amazing stuff with his company? I think that's fairly clear. Uh, but did he also have this dose of narcissism that made him perhaps a narcissistic leader to some degree? Uh, there's some evidence to that, perhaps. Right. And so, but it, 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 let's take Bezos, like in that same article, right? Didn't they uh -huh. say Bezos was the example of a good leader? Uh, well, they said he's a positive transformational leader. Right. And, and yet we've heard stuff about him, you know, he's, he ditched the, you know, mom khakis and, and got ripped and, you know, got a hot new girlfriend or wife. I don't know. Like, you know, there's some little things that are there, you know, like skilling from Enron. And, and the point of all of this to say, I don't know Bezos, right? Um, I don't know if he's a transformational leader or not. Um, well, actually, two problems here. One, when we look to leaders, we say, what have they done? Did they make a billion dollars or double GDP for X, Y, Z, or you know, all of these complex things? And that's just an outcome of a whole complex variety of factors, situation, time, moment in history group, you know, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things, you know, but if you wanted to look at the quality of a leader, it would be how they built the organization, how they accomplished things with team teams. It's kind of like a scrum master or does a scrum master write code sometimes, but not necessarily. Right. Mm -hmm. But they are that servant leader that coaches and gets the most out of all the cylinders that are firing within an org. So that's, that's the first piece is, you know, lots of times people are looking at leadership of, did they make a lot of money? Did they achieve a lot of notoriety? Right. Well, that's just fame and fortune, right? That has, in my view, that, that can be an outcome of good leadership, but that's not necessarily, that's really not leadership, right? And then the second piece is this is so hard to look at from afar. Mm -hmm. You know, every, everybody just saw jobs and, you know, he'd make, you know, this, every announcement of the iPhone is kind of the same. This is the best iPhone ever, Right. And that's what we would see. But it wasn't until after his death or close to it that we started hearing about some of those things. But none of us are close enough to see. So let's say Jobs was a narcissistic leader. Right. Um, 
it's it, it would just be hard for us to completely know or appreciate that impact because we're just kind of basking in the reputational energy rather than the day-to-day working or interacting with them. Right. So I think it's helpful now for us maybe to talk a little bit about uh, how, in this, especially in this helpful article from O'Reilly and Chapman, how they talk about this uh, this whole idea of narcissistic leader leadership and what or what narcissistic leaders do to organizations. So in that, they they have some different elements that they talk about in terms of what narcissistic leaders, um, you know, some characteristics of narcissistic leaders. So first of all, you know, this idea of grandiosity, entitlement, right. um, excessive self confidence. They seek a lot of risks, uh, and they're oftentimes impulsive. Um, they have this very high self of uh, self esteem. No self esteem issues with these folks. Um, but here's here's where it gets really except when they don't get it from other people. <laughs> yeah, perhaps right. right? It, yeah, if, it, <laughs> if other, yeah, if other people aren't giving them the approval that they need, right? Um, and where this really starts to take a negative turn uh, even more is that they have low integrity because they will you know say thing say one thing and do another, uh, and because they're oftentimes just seeking more of that approval from other people, um, more of that uh, you know they think that they're entitled to it. Uh, they also they also can be very manipulative and oftentimes even hostile with other people. So those are some characteristics of these narcissistic leaders. Um, and you know there's there's some overlap there perhaps with with the transformational piece, but then they have this added dimension of narcissism that really creates a, a dangerous mix. Right. So they seek out um, opportunities to shine. Right. Yeah. And. So this is where, because they're putting themselves out there, they may have a big social media presence, they may speak a lot at industry events or something, they fit that stereotype of a leader. Um, And they often emerge as leaders in those times of crisis and stuff. But here's one of the things, there's no evidence of objective confidence or competence, right? Um, And they see the upside in taking risks, but they're less sensitive to those downsides, Mm -hmm. right? Um, another piece is they challenge the status quo and we all, all like that. Matter of fact, it's part of most clickbait or maybe a lot of clickbait that you see. Here's five (laughs) things scientists overlook for eliminating wrinkly skin. And you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to be better than those scientists. Let's click here, you know? Um, and they're especially attractive in those uncertain or changing situations. Right. Yeah, Yeah. But one of the things is, is they just see each other as or see others as less competence, right? So everything is win or lose. They only accept positive feedback. They're totally susceptible to flattery. You know, you want to pull one over on a narcissist, you know, flattery is probably the way to go, right? (laughs) They ignore... Go ahead. And, and, you know, another piece is that they just really, they really like people to be loyal to them. And so, you know, you'll find that, you know, that that matters above expertise. And so if you have uh, people working, if you're working for a narcissist or you know a narcissist uh, who is in a leadership position, you know, if they have people who are, who they see as being disloyal to them, uh, those people are oftentimes gone, right? Those people get fired and, uh, or get pushed to the side or marginalized in some way. It's not based upon expertise. They're not these people that, you know, really want uh, lots of vigorous dissent about about what their uh, ideas are, because guess what? You know, their ideas are amazing, you know, the, uh, to them. <laughs> they, they see it all. As, Everything is awesome. And I'm leading that awesome. awesomeness. <laughs> I, I am Mr. Awesome. Right. And, uh, you know, they, they get very suspicious of, suspicious of other people. And, you know, if you challenge a narcissist uh, about their ideas, especially probably if you do this in public or in front of other people, um, they will get very aggressive. Um, and that's just because they see you as less competent. They, they have this sense of entitlement and grandiosity that, uh, that can be very problematic. And so, you know, these, um, these characteristics of the people and what they do in terms of seeking out opportunities to shine and seeing other people as, as less competent, this has some pretty nasty consequences within the organization. Uh, you know, these people can be very hostile and abusive to the people who work for them. Uh, they don't have a problem with unethical behavior because, you know, if it serves them and it makes them look better then oftentimes they, that's the calculus. That's what, that's what they'll do. Um, the cultural aspects of what they do in the organization can be rather damaging, uh, a low trust, a low integrity culture. 
Uh, and, you know, from a risk standpoint, these are the people who are going to get you into lawsuits, too. Right? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, <laughs> I mean, they may pick them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and you probably don't want to be an accountant for these people. They, they probably would, uh, you know, encourage the creative accounting uh, that sometimes organizations fall into. Um, so, you know, definitely some some negative consequences for organizations. And because of those ne negative consequences, it makes it very important for us to, to think about how do we identify, how do we avoid, how do we deal with narcissistic leaders that are around us? Right. So I see these guys, the mental picture I get in my mind is like a giant, one of those giant container ships full of garbage that's been hit by a torpedo, right? They're, <laughs> they're leaking oil. Garbage is falling to sea. And so wherever they go, they're leaving a wake of trash and garbage behind them, right? Yeah. Um, oil and all over that stuff. And that, you know, we talked about those consequences, hostile and abusive to subordinates and those kinds of things. Um, that we're going to use that information about how narcissists live their lives and go through and navigate the social environment and work environment to, to help you. So, mm -hmm. so we talked about why is it hard to spot them because they look like those transformational leaders and that kind of stuff. This also makes them tough to discover during a traditional search process, right? So especially at the executive level, yeah, right. They they know how to look good. Yeah, like they they've been specializing it in their whole lives. They know how to kind of, uh, you know, look the part and. And kind of fit the expectations of others because they really need that self, that approval from other people for them to right. feel good. And for you to engage in an executive search or search for you know a key leader or something, it's during during a time of transformation or maybe somebody's retiring. You know all all of that kind of stuff. You're vulnerable as a selector. Your brain has a problem that needs to be remedied, right? right. And so that forces you to go out and you're hoping. The, that you find the right person, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, especially if it's a CEO for a high-level company, these these searches are kind of done clandestinely, right? Nobody sure. can hear that like, oh, well, the current CEO of Yahoo's looking for another gig. Well, that doesn't do good things to stock prices, right? Mm -hmm. um, same thing if you're about to sell to venture capital or I, a whole bunch of stuff that makes these kind of search processes challenging. So... <clears throat> First thing to do is look at your firm itself, right? How does your firm have a good culture, mm -hmm. right? Or it, do you have what they call, you know, that we have this whole idea about fixed versus growth mindset, but a fixed mindset in an organization tends to rely on hiring star performers. We're just going to hire the right hot shots, get them into managers. They're going to whip the plebeians into shape and then profit right? <laughs> right. But the problem with that is that that might be the, the perfect uh, environment in which a narcissist will really thrive. Um, you know, if that's how you're only viewing it. And, you know, you kind of going back to this idea of the traditional search process, right? It's if you're doing a kind of a uh, only a superficial um, selection process whereby you have some interviews and maybe you, you know, check the references of the of the of the people that the person provided only, uh, you know, yeah, because gonna... I'm going to give a reference to somebody that's going to call me out as a total jack wagon, <laughs> right? It, right. <laughs> and so, you know, that that's just tough. What you've got to be able to do is dig deeper into those references. You've got to be able to try to uh, gather other information because, again, you know, narcissism, you don't want to misdiagnose someone and say, we're not going to hire that person because they're a narcissist. Maybe maybe the person does just whatever, look really good in a suit. That doesn't necessarily mean they're a narcissist. Uh, you know, what makes them a narcissist is that they're behaving in these grandiose and entitled ways across times and situations. So you want to be able to kind of have that large uh, swath of data that would help you know whether or not that's what you're dealing with. Right. So that the traditional search is hard. It's also hard when you start to hire at the senior manager or director level. Mm -hmm. um, because these people are new, newer executives, and they haven't had a whole lot of time to spread that hurt, trash, and, and garbage around for you to observe the way, <laughs> right? Right. So, so let's talk about, okay, so we know this is a problem. We have empathy for these people because the kind of just bent that way, 
right? Mm. And we've talked about why this is harmful to organizations and some of the key characteristics. So let's, what can organizations do to meet this challenge? And I want to say the first one is don't hire these guys. Right. So you got to think about what you are, uh, what your search processes look like. And, you know, in that search process, are you just, are you falling into the, the trap of just looking for those people who kind of fit your, uh, your folk theory about what, what looks good in this position, you know, someone with oh, yeah. the right, uh, you know, so, and, and I see this he looked all like the a time. Michelin man. No. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, or IBM yeah. man. What are... <laughs> right. You know, I see, I, I, it's just really interesting because we're, we, we can have these cognitive biases where maybe we have this image in our mind of what this person should look and sound and act like. And when a job candidate comes across our, our radar, um, if they don't fit that, then we start to see that we judge them as, as less qualified than someone who does fit that, that mm -hmm. image. And this can be somewhat unconscious too, if you're not, if you don't really carefully think about it. Um, so what I would, you know, highly recommend is you got to have some of those just, you know, you got to, this is, you got to eat your asparagus here, folks, and do the right thing when it comes to hiring. And first, you want before you talk to any candidates, before you even advertise a position, you need to really figure out with your organization what are we looking for, what makes a great, a, a really good candidate here in terms of behaviors, in terms of what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we're looking for. Um, because if you do that good definitional work, and then you know how are we going to assess those things? Um, you know, via interviews, what is it, you know, okay, so we need someone who has X type of knowledge. Well, what kinds of questions are we going to ask to tap into that? And then what does a good answer look like? And what does a not good answer look like? All of those types of things that you do well before you even talk to a single candidate, uh, th those are really important because it's going to help you to um, not get dis distracted by those things that the narcissist are going to be very good at portraying. Yeah, and it's a two-sided approach. So I've, I've dealt with boards and executive search where they say, well, we just can't seem to find anybody or the people we like turn us down. Well, the, the organization was at a time of crisis, had a horrible culture, had mm. a whole bunch of stuff. So if you have a cesspool of an organization, you're only going to get cesspool quality candidates because... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Like, what good candidate's going to go into an environment where they're not supported by the board of directors? They can't change a toxic culture that's probably been damaged over generations of leadership and go in there and thrive. So right. you need to make sure that either your organization is healthy and good, or if it's not, that that next leader is somebody that's going to turn your culture around and make it healthy and good. Because that's, that's kind of a first step, you know, while keeping the ship afloat and making some money. Don't get me wrong there. But just talking about the quality of people and leaders that you'll get. Because trash begets trash. Um, and health begets health. So you, you got to calibrate that piece. But let's say you got that. And, and, and you're ready to go. You're in a time of transformation. You need a transformational leader or an executive that can take you to the next next place. You got to move beyond those in-person interviews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, this is where you would want to do uh, a more thorough vetting of the person by trying to get, you know, into the person's background a little bit more. And this gets tricky uh, in terms of, you know, getting some of those maybe off list reference checks done. Right. And, who, and what what's legal to yeah. do or ask. Right. 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 Um, but this is where, you know, especially as you get more senior in an organization within a specific industry uh, or a group, you know, th there are people, you, people do know people. And, you know, I, I think talking to a, a wide variety of people who may have interacted with that person that could shed light on, on this person's behavior across a variety of circumstances. Now, again, you don't want to get hung up on one person's good or bad story about the person because you want to have a wide range of, of uh, experiences to, to kind of draw your conclusions from. Right. So this article that we referenced talked about, you know, non-disclosure or confidentiality type agreements, something like that, you know, sign out and see if you can get people to really tell you what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be super challenging and oftentimes can't be done. But if you don't have people on your board of directors or as part of your search that do not have good industry relationships and knowledge, especially at the senior executive level, 
you know, that's where somebody from CEO, unless you happen to be lucky like Zuckerberg and just found something, right? They generally have a length of time and you can, they'll have a reputation within that industry. Use that kind of stuff, right? Um, also, interviews. You should ask them about their past performance with the questions that verify if they take all the credit or share about building a team or achieving with a team, right. you know? So I did this, I did this, I did that, right? That's not the answer you're looking for. And it's like, well, the first thing is we needed to build a team to help establish, you know, these core competencies that then met the industry challenge at hand. You know, that that's way different than I led us to 2X GDP metric growth level <laughs> silo. You know, that that's not what you're looking for there. Right, right. Because, you know, if they are only referencing what they did and taking all that credit, what that could signal is some of these characteristics of self-centeredness and so forth that uh, that could be part of a narcissistic leadership pattern. Um, you know, another thing is, you know, you could ask the person about, you know, negative comments that that have been that they've received in the past and, you know, see how they respond, um, see how they respond to negativity about them. You know, if this is something where they are get very aggressive and, uh, you know, start to, um, you know, really fight back against any kind of negative information that's presented about them, you know, that could be a signal that they're, that they have some of this narcissism. All right. So, and especially if you're using your kind of spidey sense network to say like, what's this person reputation in our industry and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. If you hear some negative things from that, use that as well. Hey, you know, well, during your time over at XYZ company, we heard XYZ and it became a really negative and hostile culture. But narcissists will have, unless they're super high functioning, right? We'll have a hard time just saying, yeah, you know, I, you know, and responding to those things in a rational, reasonable way. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, during the interview process, seeing if they disparage other people, I mean, that, that, that would definitely be a clue that. Uh, they have some of this grandiose, you know, idea about themselves that they're putting other people down. Uh, you know, another thing that was mentioned in uh, the article was that, you know, if they get past your interview process and they're part of your organization, um, you know, is to use some 360 or what we call a multi-rater type of feedback to get more information about, you know, how people are performing and so forth. And what they recommend in the article actually is to base a large part of the person's reputation and compensation on those reviews. But that, you know, that can be pretty challenging too. Um, you know, and, and actually the, uh, the best practices here are kind of mixed. You know, some organizations say, yes, you know, you should kind of base everything on these three sixties. Um, others say, you know, that, that really should be kept separate from decisions about promotion and pay and so forth. It really should be purely for developmental purposes. Um, but I think to the extent that you can get, uh, multi-faceted feedback about a person that can be very developmental and it can be very helpful uh, for for other people in the organization to figure out, hey, you know, what's going on really with this person? Because the best, I mean, the best, uh, you know, sources of information about a person's leadership style are oftentimes the people below them, the people who whom they supposedly led, not the people who were their bosses. Right, yeah, because they know how to manage up like crazy. Oh, and, yeah. and here's the thing. You'd go through the, you learned all about the narcissist. You did your best in the interview, all the little pieces. Your job's not done. You still have to have some governance around what happens. And this largely is around not making a Petri dish that these kind of leaders can thrive in. 360 reviews and those kinds of um, evaluation of how people build and works with teams is an important part as a board of directors or as somebody that, you know, has several directors under them or VPs, those, those kinds of things. Your job's not done after the hiring. Another piece is cultural assessments. So does your organization have regular check-ins to validate the temperature of the culture there? Mm -hmm. um, these should go to the boards of directors and stuff like that. So they can start to say, well, what are we, where are the problems in our culture? It's not just about firing narcissists. You should use that to be calibrating the organization anyway, but it's definitely helpful because you'll notice pretty quickly that the tone of that uh, organization's culture will change for the worse when you have some narcissistic leadership in place.
That's right. And, you know, we are also talked about how narcissists can oftentimes have this uh, tendency to take risks, take big risks. And, you know, visionary ideas, these can be awesome. Uh, but what you can do and should do as an organization is have an appropriate type of project governance governance process to make sure that you're managing that risk and that you're mitigating uh, what's going on. You're staying involved with knowing what's going on. Right. Venture capitalists are suckers for this kind of stuff because they're looking for that 100x returns. Yeah. Right. And I mean, you may be entering that place. And so, okay, well, yeah, we're going to take this giant risk and make a bajillion dollars or flame out. Okay. Well, may maybe you go with that visionary idea from that narcissist that's like maybe leading the way. But the, the data is mixed on narcissists as firm leaders. And, and I don't really think, I, this is a place where I kind of disagree with the literature. I understand why they say that, but it's mixed because sometimes they're successful. Mm-hmm. But I would say, are they successful because of their narcissistic personality? It probably contributes some, but the volatility is yeah. a lot more. They take a ton more risks. And the question is, with your organization, if you're in a governance role or board of directors, do you want to roll the dice on a hand grenade? It may yeah. blow open a whole new door into a whole well, new world, but yeah, it may just it, kill you. And <laughs> yeah, for sure. And there's another bigger question here of even if... Let's just, you know, even if, and again, I think this is not true, but let's say that narcissistic leaders are super effective for their organizations, even if that's the case, which I don't think it is, uh, even if that were the case, however, uh, are they really promoting human flourishing? And I would say categorically that the answer no. would be no. <laughs> and uh, because of that, I think there's a an ethical and, an, and a moral reason to avoid putting narcissists in charge and to try to spot and avoid uh, narcissistic leadership. You know, and, and going back to this idea of creating some project governance and so forth, uh, this can really create an environment that narcissists don't like. And so, you know, perhaps part of your in interviewing process for candidates, you could talk about, hey, here's what we do to manage projects. Here's how we govern and so forth, because then a narcissist could, you know, self-select out at that point, be like, because they may realize, oh, I'm not going to do so great if I'm getting, you know, this type of oversight. And they may opt out of the process, which could be a good thing for you. That's another way to get, get them out of your, uh, your selection pipeline. Yeah. So I want to wrap up with a quote from Michael McCoby, and he's written some of the best books and articles on narcissistic leaders. Um, one of his books of note on this is Narcissistic Leaders, Who Succeeds and Fails. Um, but, and I think it was in that book, a quote from him is, um, narcissistic leaders can be extraordinarily useful, even necessary. And it's more on the risk side and, and pushing through to new places. But he concluded on a more somber note that observing in spite of their potential benefits, much of the damage done to organizations has resulted from the arrogant and unethical behavior of corporate leaders. Mm, very powerful things to remember, and it's certainly relevant to this idea of narcissistic leadership. So today in the podcast, you know, we uh, we talked about narcissistic leadership. Uh, we talked about, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, Narcissism is a personality disorder. Uh, it's also something that we that has some commonalities with transformational leadership. So we talked about what it is, and we talked about what they can do to organizations. Hint, not a good thing, right? Uh, and then we talked about how to spot and avoid and deal with some of those narcissistic leaders that you might find around you in your life and in your organizations. All right, and I, and I want to add a final note. It's not that narcissists uh, don't ever do anything good. It's just you're really, really playing with fire. And you need to think about that before you, you know, make a deal with the devil. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.